and welcome to yet another edition of Nima's Bantaba. My name is Nima Chetama. Bantaba is a traditional meeting point where people meet um, and discuss about issues that are actually happening in the society. Um, on, on Nima's Bantaba, we basically discuss about issues um, with a focus on migration, women empowerment, and culture with people from diverse background um, here in Germany and across outside. So, um, so today our topic actually is impact of social media in curbing irregular migration with a focus um, in West Africa. Germany is actually doing all it takes in curbing irregular migration, mainly from the sub-Saharan regions. One way is through funded information project by the German Foreign Office. The Migrant Media Network project provides young Africans with reliable information and training on migration issues and social media to make informed decisions and be aware of migration options to Europe. The MMN also promotes youth entrepreneurship at home as a way to build economic and social resilience, encouraging youth to create their own opportunities and work within their communities focus in the Gambia and Ghana. Today, Nimas Bantava is actually joined by the Migrant Media Network Project Manager Susanna, Susanna Bellinghausen. Um, and also via Zoom, we have Benedictus Akpolo. I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, Benedictus is the um, local coordinator or, or, or manager for diaspora and also in Ghana. Um, I am excited to learn about the project, I mean the Migrant Media Project, what you guys do. And first of all, thank you for honoring our invitation and welcome to our studios in Alex Billion on Nimas Bantaba. Thank you for having me. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm very excited. Cool. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous. Cool. Hi, Ben. Hi there. How are you? I'm good. Um, I'm doing great. And cool. yes, I'm good. Thanks for joining us as well. So uh, my first question actually goes yeah. to Susanna, and um, I would like for you to take us through um, or give us an overview about the Migrant Media Network. How did it all start and, 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 and why tackling um, irregular migration through social media and community engagement? So you introduced it quite nicely, actually, already. Um, so it started uh, in 2019. Um, a former colleague of mine, uh, Thomas Kalunga, initiated it. Um, he's a migration expert, uh, has a lot of experience himself. And um, we were realizing we work a lot at Rogue with um, the impact of social media on lots of things, conflict, migration, and uh, also about telling the truth on social media. And so the idea was to take that experience that we already have into the migration diaspora issues because we realize that people migrate and they're not informed well or they're misinformed. So the project is all about actually giving people access to information, to proper information, so they can make a choice, you know, a, a proper choice of, uh, of what to expect. Um, I propose, or uh, speaking of people migrating without being informed, uh, and this leads me to my second question. Um, doesn't this look like Germany is actually, let's say, leading the way to curbing irregular migration um, from the West African regions? Well, I think what Germany is, is trying to do um, is to really inform people. I mean, there is, there has always been migration. There will always be migration. People will migrate. That is totally normal. The only problem is that, you know, if people migrate irregularly, mm -hmm. it is very dangerous. And I think people have to be, or we think people have to be aware of the dangers of irregular migration and of opportunities, you know, alternatives, regular migration, opportunities, home. And if you migrate irregularly, you have to be aware, um, and, and I think in West Africa, there's also a lot of human trafficking. People are, you know, made believe something that is not reality. And so to, to, to give the facts and to show people what can happen, that's really what we want to do so people know what they're doing. Yeah, actually, I mean, that's a general rule. I would say most of the people or African people think that uh, it's paradise here and everything is gold. So you can just have money from the three and, and, and stuff like that. But actually, one thing that actually triggers me is why West Africa and particularly Ghana and the Gambia? 
Yeah, so um, I think Ghana and the Gambia, I mean, I think in West Africa in general, we could do this project all over, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's of course a funding issue. Um, I think Ghana and Gambia both have a lot of uh, human traffickers, yeah. and um, they also have a big diaspora in Germany. So the project was started off also with a very strong emphasis on the diaspora and what the, the influence the diaspora has on the people at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we also started off with having a workshop in Berlin with the Ghanaian diaspora at first and then had them trained on their social media behavior, go to Ghana and you know inform young people there, especially in rural areas where you don't have access to internet or other information sources. And uh, so I think it's the diaspora also that is um, a factor. Thank you, that's Claire. Benedict Tours, um, can you tell us what is your role as a um, community manager for Diaspora and also for Ghana? What do you do? Okay, so um, as my colleague Susie already mentioned, it is also important to look at the role that the Diaspora plays, right? So in, in able to enable the Diaspora make a truthful storytelling process to impact the, the migrant, the potential migrants back home or the migrants um, in transit. Mm -hmm. what, we, what I do in my capacity is to manage offline and online communities, um, MMN communities, to ensure that the aims and the goals of the projects are well communicated and also um, manage the diaspora mentors, help them plan and coordinate mentors online and offline activities as well as um, plan and engage them in um, already existing diaspora meetup groups, as well as um, managing the diaspora community in Berlin on communications concerning irregular and regular migration, sharing, of course, the knowledge on perspectives and opportunities at home, also through social media. And we, uh, we are also focusing much more on social media because this is the first point of information that mostly um, potential migrants face to, um, they look up to for information. Um, so uh, this is just actually like a follow-up question from Susanna's question that I asked on the, um, um, the focus countries. So I'm actually interested to know from your side, like, um, who are involved? I mean, what type of people are you guys targeting? I know, for example, in Berlin uh, or in the diaspora, your target group is Ghanaians in the diaspora who you train, who you were part of in 2019 at the beginning. Uh, but in Africa, who are you targeting um, and why? So as stakeholders involved in this project, then again, we would say, of course, the government comes in as um, one of the main stakeholders. We also look at... Um, the youth, the youth um, the African youth, and also the diaspora. So the youth, when I talk of the youth, I mean um, people from the age of 17 years old, 18 years old, up to 35, 34, 45, 46, because these are the people, this class of people are mostly um, like liable to travel abroad and also use the irregular routes of, trans, um, of um, transporting themselves or migrating from one point to other to um, the African countries, as no. well as, yes. Yeah, continue. So, as well as um, people who are also in need of um, being able to travel from one place to another, looking at um, the standards which comes with them, what, what actually happens is that we look at people who willingly want to travel regularly, but they don't have the access to do that and we relocate we them there in, 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 um, in the villages and the rural areas to be able to talk to them and show them the right way, give them factual information about migration, as well as um, showing them the smart migration plan so they can make an informed decision before they migrate. So basically, we look at um, the, the youth, the, the, the African youth at the ages of 15, no, 17, sorry, 17 to 45. You want to add something there, Susan? Yeah, I, I, this is totally correct. I think what is important also is to mention, and that's why we're, you know, concentrating on the rural areas, is that it's it's also impacting the families. It's not, you know, not just the person that migrates, migrates, but it's also a whole, uh, the whole story behind it. You know, families are putting money together for a person to leave, and then you know they might, you know, return. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's it's basically somehow impacting all of the whole society, but. Uh, mm. 
Um, yes, of course, youth is the most most common. Um, actually, I, I learned that you people are using, I mean, it's clear that you people are using social media and community engagement in informing um, um, the target groups. Which other means are you, are you guys using um, to inform them and, and, and how do you get to them? Yeah, so because we realize that lots of people are offline actually and you know, not all of them are using social media and then only for a very short amount of time, which makes it difficult to verify the information that you're reading, um, we uh, produced a couple of offline sources. So we developed a field guide, it's called. Um, so it's an informational kit that has a booklet in it that talks about migration. Mm -hmm. It has a migration game. It has a migration poster where you get very brief information on migration issues, mm -hmm. but we also produced a Hyrax box, which is like a Raspberry Pi offline server, which you can use, and we distribute this to community centers and you know churches. You can go and basically surf on the websites that we have downloaded onto this server and get your information you know, and take as much time as you want, um, and we try to update this as much as possible. And how effective is this? Well, we think it's, you know, bit by bit, it's relatively effective. I mean, of course, we are using um, the means of having workshops. So we have the local coordinators uh, in different regions. At the moment, we have uh, four different regions in Ghana where they have uh, kind of bantabas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we call them stammtische, where they meet in a very kind of casual way. 15 to 20 people and they talk about their experience. They maybe have a routine, talk about what they experience while you know being in the irregular route. And um, so that's that's probably the the best way to address people. Wow. Um, ben, um, like I said before, you were actually part of um, the first batch um, in 2019 when the projects just started. Um, you were part of the diaspora Ghanaians that were actually trained and sent to Ghana to actually train uh, people that ended up being used as local coordinators that are actually organizing these training sessions and so on. Um, with the people that are to be informed. Would you mind to actually share with us your experience from this training and um, um, how was the selection done? How were the people from the diaspora, Ghanaian diasporas involved? Were their criteria set those, okay, these are the people that we want to use to train them and inform people, or it was just random? Okay, um, let me first of all talk about the criteria for selecting the diasporas. I think um, what we what we looked at was also the dynamics of um, the migration patterns and flows in Ghana. Mm -hmm. We were able to determine which regions needed um, the much attention or the sensitization campaign there, mm -hmm. and which regions were dominant. So we were able to do this and not this internal assessment and. Um, this was also how come we were able to select these um, 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 local coordinators or diaspora trainers. And going deep into that, um, also we had also to look at the educational level, our educational level, of course, literacy level, and um, also what, um, what motivated us to be able to join this campaign. And if you were willing to do that, and we, if we were also... Um, if we were also equipped, if I say equipped after the workshop, if we, we had if we had gained a lot of insight and were knowledgeable enough to share or exchange these experiences with other people on, on the ground. Yes, um, my experience was quite amazing because I had the opportunity to go to my village, which is in the Volta region, mm -hmm. to be able to talk to the youth there as well as um, the elderly people as well to talk to their to, to pass on the message to their children and their children. Because what happens in the Volta region is that you have most of the youth migrating to the urban cities. And from the urban cities, then you have um, the, the um, national migration. From national migration, then you have international migration where people would want to migrate from one country to the other. And of course, they do this um, by, by road to the urban cities. So I had the chance to speak to um, these people in the rural areas. I organized three workshops. And within these three workshops, we were able to understand the fact that, yes, um, there are certain things, certain amenities missing in the community. And these amenities are also some of the push 
factors that sent them away from the, the region. So um, we looked at through the workshop, we were able to come up with some of um, some of um, the solutions to these problems. One, we talked about skills development. We also talked about um, empowering oneself through education and also through the mentorship program. And um, within within this framework, I was able to organize and create a group of people who constantly met after I have left to talk about the same solutions in the in the in the um, in the in the in the region, creating a network of peer to peer um, colleagues who come together to talk about pressing issues and developmental issues at the same time, passing on the training that I have given to them based on um, their migration, smart migration, and uh, plan before you pack team, they were able to spread this message across and become multipliers in the um, localities. Um, how easy or how difficult was this disseminating this information to the local people was especially, let's say, their parents? Because we all know I'm um, coming from African countries. Um, it's really, or it's almost impossible to convince people that Europe is not as they thought it is. Um, Europe is not that easy to live in or to travel, like you said, plan before you leave. And um, often some will tell you, if it's not easy, what are you doing there? Come back home. Um, yes. That means they don't even listen to you. So I was wondering how easy or difficult was it with you to inform these people? Were they even listening? Yes, um, sometimes it is also very lucky on, we are quite fortunate on our part that we tend to also include um, returning migrants into this whole campaign process. So the returning migrants are um, first off very important to us because they also share their true life stories. And without the storytelling process, um, it feels like um, they would probably wouldn't have listened to you. But what I also look at is that I share my experience mm -hmm. based on the fact that I have been able to come to Europe and I have able, I'm able to complete, successfully complete my education. Mm -hmm. I tell them the things that we actually face here. I, 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 try every, I try every possible means to be able to articulate how, how, the, living, how the living experiences is and how the lifestyle is. Based on these um, experiences that I shared with them, they are also able to follow up on um, on the, on the government web page, which is um, Germany um, website, to be able to have also informed um, knowledge and decisions about their proud to their um, proud to their migration. It is also important to mention that um, we also use. Um, Rumors about Germany, mm -hmm. a platform owned by um, the government to be able to articulate some of these rumors and frictions to fight them and also to mitigate them in such a way that they would be able to understand the need. It is, um, I quite remember um, sometime um, within the workshop, I also had the privilege to play some of these videos of um, people crossing um, the Mediterranean Sea in boats, and also in the inhumane um, situations where potential migrants or migrants in transit find themselves in Libya. Some of these stories actually brings up um, that sort of awareness in, in the participants that they are already um, informed that no, the journey is wrong and then the dangers. We also talk about the risk involved on the desert and then on the sea. And these things as well add up to the um, the campaign for them to know and be self-aware of the problems that are being faced and and and, and the risk involved traveling irregularly. Thank you very much for that brief um, overview. <laughs> and Susanna, um, if you were to define irregular migration, what is irregular migration actually to you? And who migrates irregularly? Who is illegal? 
Well, I mean, irregular migration is defined by crossing the border without the proper paperwork, basically. For us, um, for me, I, I think at MMN we talk about irregular migration, like we, we call it backdoor migration. Mm -hmm. So what we really address is the migration that is um, threatening people's lives because they, you know, pay people to enormous amounts of money to uh, go through the desert, to uh, uh, become slaves, to uh, go go in the boats that, you know, might sink. So they risk their lives. Mm -hmm. And that for us is, um, you know, very regular migration becomes really um, um, dangerous and something that we need to talk about. Um, so that's, that's sort of the point we take on this. So apart from just talking about these issues through social media, through community engagement, um, through the USSD, that um, people should not migrate, I mean, irregularly because there are dangers involved, the border and so on. Um, what all the, let's say not just information, are there other opportunities that you tell them, okay, here is an opportunity that you could do, what you are looking for in Europe, we can give it to you. Mm -hmm. Does this involve um, I mean, how do you convince these people to stay? Yeah, so, I mean, of course, I haven't mentioned, of, we, ha we have a website where we try to, which we try to use as like a resource center where we collect, um, you know, links and information to educational websites, to how to travel safely, how to apply for a visa, um, where you could, you know, how you can get jobs or you can't get jobs. So that's also part of um, part of one one threat that we follow. And then we, we try, I mean, this, of course, has come up a lot also when we, you know, talk in the community you know, what is the alternative then? What is the positive alternative? Uh, and so we started this, uh, this this year actually that we want to combine the, the Stammtische also with some entrepreneurial aspect. So we have uh, um, a local coordinator, she's called Rhoda Vedma. She is uh, an entrepreneur. And so she suggested, you know, we have one hour of migration talk and, you know, maybe then uh, an idea of how could you produce soap. And then you do a hands-on soap production. So to, you know, combine these two things. And I think that is, is the way forward. And uh, of course, ideally, uh, it would, it would, uh, we would have actually, you know, an, um, some more training towards entrepreneurship, which is, I guess, a bit beyond the scale of the project right now. But Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And of course, it would be very important if opportunities are also there, not just informing them yeah. that don't travel and at the end it's just like that. I, I, I bet it would be difficult to actually let, get them, keep them stay. Um, one of your target countries, the Gambia, is actually among countries that really uh, surpasses many African countries engaging in irregular migration. In your opinion, or through your engagement since you started this project in Gambia, why is this so? Well, it's, that is very fresh. Our Gambia project is, has just kicked off uh, in the beginning of this month. And, um, well, I mean, looking at Gambia and considering, I mean, I'm always flabbergasted, like the every, average age is 17. Um, there's just so much youth in Gambia. And um, I think they all look for opportunities and for, for challenges. And I think they're probably not provided. Now people don't have jobs and uh, that makes them thrive for something different, which mm -hmm. is totally understandable, yeah. Um, Benedictus, in your opinion, I did like to know um, what is the root cause of irregular migration? Coming from, a, from, from an African perspective, as a migrant yourself, um, of course you came through studying and so on, but what do you think causes irregular migration? Well, the causes of irregular migration is um, I think we should also look at it from the push and pull factor. After that, we could also look at it from um, the economic aspect of um, the home country. So I think it is the desperation of someone wanting to migrate from one place to another mm -hmm. based on the factors that are pushing him to migrate, right? And um, these, these ones are so pressing that you you um, you take all you use by all means to be able to migrate from a situation in which you find yourself uncomfortable, and um, I think we talk about one being lack of um, education, also employment discrimination on gender basics, domestic violence, lack of opportunities and channel for legal 
migration, there's also peer pressure, there is poverty, and there's also environment. So these, these are the factors that allows people or, or incites people to move out of their, um, or to, to, um, to migrate from one place to the other in search of these, um, as to, in these um, quality of life or quality in life, I should say. Um, and also, like, yes. how firm are you that the project in Ghana would really be of impact uh, 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 to to your cause? I mean, um, to what you wished for for the project? How is it going? Let's say at the moment, and how firm are you in the future that it will change something? People will listen. People will not migrate irregularly. Well, that is an interesting one because. Um, the overall objective of this project is that we want to, to have a behavioral change in how the diaspora and the potential migrant engages on social media concerning migration and also how they perceive migration, right? So if you're able, I think we, we are also doing that. And then um, we've been able to have feedback from um, the participants. And also with the feedback that we've had, we've been able to go back to our drawing board to say that, yes, um, we need to impact the society more. So let's, let's also look at the positive alternative. The positive alternative meaning when someone is, um, someone is comfortable doing something or someone has, for example, entrepreneurship going on or they have a business going on, they are, they've, be, they've improved themselves from one, one point to the other, it is more like it is more likely that that person would stay and not migrate. Based on our research, we are able to find these out, these things out, and then um, I guess moving forward, we would um, look more into it to make sure that we have also other resources on board to help um, the the host, the, the potential migrant stay in his or his um, origin, um, country origin. Thank you. Um, Susanna, you actually made mention that um, the Gambia project is basically new. Um, and I was wondering, like, what have you already done there? Um, I mean, there is a local coordinator in Gambia who is spearheading all the five local coordinators in different regions in the Gambia. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us due to internet issue. Um, so I did like to know, right, right now, what is going on in the Gambia? Yeah, so um, we had like a kickoff event um, at the beginning of May. Um, where the lady from the German office, a minister from the youth ministry came and it was uh, you know, very well received because everybody seems to be really thinking that this is a very important project for the Gambia, mm -hmm. which made us of course very happy because we realized this is you know, the place to be. Mm -hmm. um, and as we cooperate with the National Youth, Gambian National Youth Council, who already also does um, sensitization towards yeah. migration, mm -hmm. um, they invited 10 trainees. So the, the stakeholder meeting was followed by a two-day training, two-and-a-half-day training um, of already very competent um, community activists. And um, they got introduced to what the MMN does and what you know we're planning to do. And so we chose five of those people to go into the different rural areas, is basically, I guess, where they come from to go into the communities and do exactly the same thing, do these kind of, um, you know, Stammtische um, and, and educate people on migration. And I think what's really important also is to, um, you know, the way how you approach the, the, the community, as you said, like how do I approach the community that, you know, the elders actually appreciate what we do and that it's accepted what we talk about and not just something that comes from the outside. And that's also why it's essential, you know, that it's really local people and people that are trusted. Now, going back to um, the target countries, Gambia and Ghana, obviously when you talk of human trafficking um, in the sub-Saharan region, Nigeria is one of the countries that actually come up first, yes. especially on um, women trafficking. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you target Nigeria instead, or why is it excluded? Mm. So I have to be very honest here, this is not our choice entirely. So the German Foreign Office suggested to take the Gambia because they think it's you know, important there. I'm not sure if they already have a project like that going in, uh, in Nigeria, but you're right. It's, uh, there's a lot of other countries one could also imagine to run this project in, yeah. Um, one might ask, or one might think, uh, okay, the German government is actually targeting a small country like the Gambia to stop people from migrating. Mm. Um, 
let's say illegally as they would call it uh, because right now that there, there, there is a lot of discussions going on I think since 2018 um, with regards to this so-called win-win situation for Germany and Gambia pioneered by a migration expert and of course the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is 100% involved um, I could remember last year um, was an exchange series of meeting between Gambian government officials and German government officials and Maya was there and one could ask Germany is doing really so much or putting pressure on the Gambian government and its people to just eradicate irregular migration despite how small this country is. Mm -hmm. um, how involved is your project in such thing or the idea is just to disseminate information in covering this? Yeah, so our, our project really does not, um, no, it's not attempting to stop migration per se. It's really about giving information and making very clear what the information, the information that is outside is mis and disinformation to make very clear what the real information is and what is a rumor and what is reality and especially you know talking to people that have experienced these things so it's not just you know of course you could think this is something you know the government makes up in order to stop us from migrating that's why it's important that it's clear that you know returnees talk about their experience and that's that's why we do this so it's it's not going to stop migration it's just going to you know guide it in the right direction hopefully actually i don't think migration could be stopped no it's, every, it's gonna happen all, uh, all the time every, yes. everybody actually have the right to all to, over the to place to yes. move yes. so um anyway um benedict is um so yeah you were not in gambia but then have you since the um start of this project registered any um success story let's say um in ghana have you, for example, yes. seen anyone that, that really, really decided to, to migrate irregularly and then through the community engagement, information sharing and so on, decided that ah, this information is really vital, is really relevant, I had changed my mind? Yes, um, it was quite wonderful that we did um, <clears throat> register one success story and well it is I, I would say one because that's is, that's this is so far what we've come across but yes um, we had one participant who had already paid three thousand euros to um, a human smuggler and was awaiting his his um he was awaiting his dates to be smuggled into Europe I should say and then he realized that after the after the workshop it was not a good thing to do so he actually did not embark on that journey. He couldn't retrieve his money back. And then he's um, now looking forward to prosecuting this particular human trafficker. And aside that, um, I should also say that um, one of our groups, um, one of our stumptish groups is now organizing a soap making um, classes so they can empower the ladies and then the women as well in that locality to be able to produce soap, which would in, in turn um, help and skill them to be able to earn a, a, a decent amount, a decent living, yes. I think this is quite um, a success story. And we are also encouraging all the other local coordinators to be able to involve in, to be able to involve their participants in such um, skills and training development processes to be able to have products which they can in the end sell and make a living out of it and rather than talking about irregular uh, rather than thinking or focusing on irregular migration um we say per se more of creating more empowerment um more empowerment yeah. exactly so you you mentioned something very important with regards to women apropos of women that Susa. um why do you think it's really important to involve women um, in talking to women uh, uh, um, about irregular migration, that they should stay home? Yeah, well, uh, not that they should, should stay home, but we realize that women migrate differently than men do, and they have completely different agendas, uh, problems, uh, challenges, uh, dangers that they face when they when they migrate, and uh, therefore we want to. We have already, you know, f focused on that topic, but we want to emphasize that a lot more because we think it is of uh, vital importance, and therefore also in Gambia, I'm very happy that you know of, of the five trainers we have, like. Uh, three women or even more um, so because I think women also talk differently to women and um, 
I think they, they migrate for different reasons and so we might also there need to change our agenda a little bit. I think it's probably not just uh, entrepreneurship but it's also often on a private level. Um, I think that's something we really need to tackle this year and, and put more emphasis on. Um, you made mention of like um, you organize community outreaches like um, Stamtisch mm -hmm. or you call it Bantabash stuff. What, what is actually mainly the topic of discussion? I know obviously it's irregular migration, mm. but how is this done um, in which of the regions or, or where exactly do they go? Do they travel in, in, in different regions or how is it organized? So we, we organized it that way. Last year we had a couple of more local coordinators in Ghana. This year it's only four and they are already in different regions. So they do it in their region where they know the people, where they speak the local language. And the idea is that it's a very informal meeting people, you know, get together maybe on a regular basis, they come back, they can discuss different topics and just basically, you know, don't have it like listening in but have an interactive and this year we also want to have it maybe more with, you know, people performing, we can play this game together that we developed as a migration game and um, and in, in that sense, it's, it's kind of a very casual thing. And we hope also that, because it developed out of the, the first local coordinators coming the, from the diaspora, um, you know, that these people that come there and, and think this is interesting might take this to their community and become kind of a multiplier. I mean, that's the idea of the project that at some, you know, at some level this is going to, if this project doesn't exist anymore, it's going to continue to exist in the sense of, you know, Stammtisch is also something that you actually quite enjoy. It's not supposed to be just, you know, listening in, but actually participating. Um, ben, I mean, uh, yeah. how how easy or difficult it is in um, informing Ghanaian um, diasporans in in Germany or in Berlin per se, uh, because obviously um, some of us, the Africans, when we here, we thought we are integrated, but. They, we're still not really integrated, and some of them do not actually really create time for to talk on issues like migration because we just have this belief that everybody should migrate and that's it, either irregularly or the normal way, legally. So do you actually face difficulties in informing these people? How easy do you find to have them listen to you or difficult? I think um, what, what we, we in put in place to be, yes, well, I would say it is a little bit difficult because one, most of the diasporans here don't have, um, they will tell you they don't have time all the time. And it is because their lives have been shadowed such a way that they are always busy. Um, yes, and what we, what we did in this respect was to um, recruit um, diaspora mentors. And these diaspora mentors have this communication with the diaspora. So, it is also that one diaspora, we have four diaspora mentors now, and there is two of them here in Berlin, one in um, Uniberg, and then also one in Frankfurt. So having this network of diasporas, meaning that we also have smaller communities of these, um, the, the network of the diasporas, the Ghanaian diasporas in these different regions. And as a, as a matter of fact, they, they, they host online events to be able to um, communicate or spread the, the, the campaign across these diasporas that they have in these different regions. And so I would say yes, on a one-to-one -one basis, you may be likely not to find one um, single diaspora who has time for you to talk to. But on the other hand, through social media, WhatsApp group chats, and also through Facebook, we are able to um, have this open conversations with these diasporans, these African Ghanaian diasporans in this section. And um, I think we are also looking at how best we'll be able to involve them more into this conversation. Also regarding the COVID, it's not been of a best time, but um, I hope that in, in the near future, we should be able to um, bring all these diaspora group, different groups together as a main, um, as one body to discuss this uncomfortable topic. And yes, I think it is also uncomfortable discussing these topics around the diaspora. So there's somehow a little bit, um, we, we, we mostly trek on a very cautious path not to um, 
overstep our boundaries when it comes to this irregular migration topic, especially in the diaspora. Yeah, I'm still actually interested um, on the target groups of this diasporan people. Do you just really target people like, let's say, migrants like you who actually came for studies, who are working, or do you go for refugees as well? For example, people who are in the park. When we actually say irregular migration, um, our thoughts actually goes to these people that are actually in the park because obviously most of them came through the Mediterranean and this is time as irregular migration. So. Which among this group do you actually target and why? So yes, um, there's also one group that we normally don't talk about, it is the people who overstayed. And um, with, with the case of Ghana, you find um, close to 10% of its total migrants, immigrants here, being people who came by sea, right? Most often what we see is that they overstay, they are... Um, yeah, staying period, which makes them um, also irregular migrants in the end, because when they do these things, they go underground and they are not able to be um, seen on, or they don't they don't report to the various authorities. And so, yes, we target this group of people one, and also um, with the refugees, we are not um, we are not so much into contact with them, but uh, we also have some of our mentors who deliberately try to make contact with them. I should say that, yes, it is also not easy contacting these um, refugees because, one, some of them are also scared of being exposed or being um, their data privacy, being not able to protect their data for them and bringing them into the limelight, which is not the case. So sometimes it is quite not easy to talk to them in person. But, yes, um, Aside that, we've been able to talk to a couple of them, and uh, we continue to reach out to them. And and in this in this sense, we are more focused on the the, the African you no know, the Ghanaian diaspora who normally overstays his his visa when he's being granted visa to stay in Europe, which is also turned as irregular migration. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, there? I would like to add that I, I totally agree with you. I think um, looking back at our workshops that we've done here with the diaspora, we were lacking actually, you know, the, the aspect of the, the irregular migrant. I think also because as Benedicto said, they're really afraid to, to, to join an event like that that's very official. And therefore, I want to mention that this, this year we're planning to do a lot of podcasts and radio where we want to give voices to these people that, you know, don't want necessarily want to be seen, mm -hmm. but want to tell their story. And and uh, we already have like a lot of stories that are quite fascinating, and I think um, that will be really interesting. Um, Susanna, you actually founded or co-founded the Rock Agency for Open Culture, and on the Rock, I think the Migrant Media Network is also part of an other um, um, project on the Rock. You've actually cross carpeted Africa in so many different African countries many times. And I did like to know from your experience, like what have you learned in comparison to Germany, let's say coming from a totally different culture? Yeah. In migration um region. Area. Well, in migration uh, direction, of course, I, I've learned a lot because I'm, you know, not a specialist. I'm also not a migrant. Um, for me, I've worked a lot on other projects in countries like South Sudan and, mm -hmm. and the refugee settlements in northern Uganda. And um, what I have learned is really what strikes me is that, you know, these African countries have so much potential. And I met so many creative people. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, full of energy and you know wanting to do things and not being able to mm -hmm. um, not being given the chance or not having the opportunity having to leave their country because of war um, so I think if we can you know give these people the possibility and that's what we're trying to do at Rogue to give them access to knowledge and skills and empower them to do stuff uh, also women most amazing women I've, I've ever met um, then I think we really have um, that's a real aim and we really have reached uh, uh, our goal and, and that's what we're trying to do and we do it bit by bit and you know in the communities but yeah you have to be patient and it will it will have its aim okay um we're fast approaching um the end of the interview or questions um ben 
So I did like to know, like, um, do you guys have any special plan um, in the offing, um, let's say, especially regarding the just a newly launched project in Gambia? Um, what's, what's happening, let's say, in the next few coming months? I think in the Gambia, it is also uh, one of our major priority to be able to empower the youth in, in the Gambia by, of course, I think most most organizations have already been through this whole campaign process there, but the thing is a positive alternative. We are looking forward to be able to create a sustainable um, positive alternative for the youth in Gambia, for them to be able to rely on that and not um, rely on irregular migration. I think Susie can also go into details on that. Well, I was just thinking, ooh, that's a challenge. <laughs> that's a challenge. Well, I think we're going to start to, to implement it the way we did in Ghana, to, and, and of course adjust it to the Gambian context. Um, and I think what, and that's what the project relies on in general, um, to get feedback, to see, you know, does this make sense at all? Or, you know, does it work differently in the Gambia? Do we need to approach people differently? Do we, um, you know, do we do hands-on things, or do we just, uh, you know, educate them? It's, it's we'll have have to see. We also have to see, I think, the, the local coordinators we have are very experienced, so they probably already know in what direction this is going to go. So we'll have to have our first meetings and discuss this and really see. I mean, it's really for them to decide because they're on the ground, they know what's going on, and you know, that's that's what's going to determine how it's going to go. Mm. Um, you just made mention of like um, you working on radio talk shows or podcasts here where people would actually share their encounters, I mean, their experiences about leaving here, about irregular migrations, about what they went through. And I was wondering how. Would the people, for example, in Gambia and Ghana, would actually get access to this podcast uh, or information said from people or by people here in the diaspora? And how effective would this information be? Them. Yeah, so I mean, it's of course going to be on our website, but uh, we're hoping that we can maybe also stream it on um, on radio stations that people can hear locally. Um, so we're hoping that that is effective. If not, we're also planning on doing radio shows so that you know on on public radio that people really listen to, and um, and that's that's then more the local coordinator to to be done with them. That people we did that already in Ghana last year. That there's a certain topic when people can call in and discuss it on the radio and. Uh, and that was very successful. And, and there we also want to maybe you know, look into, for example, get somebody from the DRD in to talk about you know, scholarships and, and as an alternative, for example, yeah. Um, you actually made mention at the beginning, um, the, when you were saying how the project started and so on, uh, that you're working with, for example, the Ministry of um, no, National Youth Council, which is, of course, under government, and I was like, Okay, they're working with government entity, and personally, to be quite honest with you, I have problem with um, NGOs or projects, uh, 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 you know, supporting such topic or issues. Um, for example, in Gambia, and they work with government officials because for me, what first come to my mind is crops and um, they use the money for their own selfish uses for their own pockets and at the end the people that we are talking it's just like you said uh, uh, the media is talking about diversity without migrant so um, for me it's just like using that money without them and they didn't even know what's going on if the money is there or not and it's just publishing about the project is happening and so on so I hope the migrant media network is not making such a mistake or it's not directly really involved with government in terms of when it comes to just disposing finances to making sure that the project is stable, continue going, and the people that are supposed to benefit are actually benefiting. Yeah, so so that's that's why we have a local coordinator or the, the country manager, that's the person who basically coordinates the local coordinators, and he's he's directly employed by us mm -hmm. and he works for us and you know for the community and we decide what we want to do and how we do it and what we think is best and the, the youth council really we, we always need a local partner you know as a as a relation in the country but they, they don't really have much to say to be very honest on a on a implementation level that's cool and uh, my final question actually goes to uh, Benedict I, I mean you're also not just involved with MMN um, on the um, rock um, agency for open culture, but then also you are man part of the Defy Hate Now project, um, which I find quite interesting myself. Would you 
tell us a bit about this project and what you do there. So my role at the Fair Haze now is um, the resource person, uh, resource personnel, I should say, and uh, it's more or less about the field guide, the educational materials, mm -hmm. and being able to distribute these educational materials and having a record of them, who we send them to, which organizers are, which um, organizations or partner, uh, partners are implementing them, and we also follow up to get feedback on these. Um, on these materials that we we send out to be used, so the fire hate noun is um, was actually an initiative to help to help combat um, hate speech to mitigate online hate speech as well as um, bringing the, the affected neighborhood together to be able to um, coming together to be able to discuss these topics relating to hate, um, relating to hate speech. And then we also make sure that we are then equipping the community, the, the media presence, also the journalism, the civil society, all these stakeholders coming together to be able to build peace, um, to be able to undertake this, um, this form of, um, this form of um, discussion and also coming to this conclusion that yes, we need peace. So defy hate noun is mostly um, defy hate noun. I should say it is um, is, is um, a peace building and also so, um, social social um, social not social media but yeah social media mitigation on hate speech. And um, with this, I think Susie would also be the right person to talk more on this. Yeah, and also maybe you can also add on the Feminist Cafe, which I find very interesting. Uh, when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's more of women empowerment. Yes, yes. Um, well, Defy It Now, I mean, I think Benedicto said everything that needs to be said. It's uh, com trying to combat online hate speech in different areas of, and, and see how the impact on the ground is uh, actually violence uh, incited through the social media. Um, the Feminist Cafe uh, started off um, two years ago when we had an uh, open forum, which we did during Republica, we said, you know, we want to do our own little Republica at the Open Culture Office, and um, we decided we need to talk more about women issues. Um, and my colleague, Blen Desta, who is a feminist and um, our uh, gender advisor in the office, she said, you know, let's let's uh, have an e a feminist cafe, invite people over. We had, which of course was good because there were lots of people there at Republica also. And um, then this this was the first cafe uh, where people, we had a woman from Kudzai from Zimbabwe. We had somebody from Kenya talking about the politics of hair, which was super interesting for me and really opened my eyes <laughs> uh, about, uh, you know, the African hair politics. And um, yeah, and, and we want to create the safe space in our office where, you know, we can, which of course now due to Corona, we cannot do, um, you know, have discussions on issues that, you know, we think is, is uh, are important. So we um, hope we can do this again, but we want to take it maybe in an on to an on online platform and uh, continue the Feminist Cafe there and, you know, build a community of, uh, of women that uh, can exchange. Good luck, and I hope that um, the Feminist Cafe will be able to empower more women into feminism. <laughs> <laughs> That's the aim. <laughs> yeah, and my final question is, I realize like if you go through rock, um, most or all of your projects are in Africa, and I wonder why, why Africa? Why the focus in Africa? What is, um, what struck you, or what is so fascinated mm -hmm. about this, this African regions that you choose to do your various projects in? Yeah. How did the motive come about? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, as I already said, you know, it has a, a, a tremendous potential. Um, I think it started off with our first project was in South Sudan, and we were just fascinated by the fact that there is a new country <laughs> in this world that, you know, we were hoping that, you know, that because it's so new, things could be done differently. Yeah. Also looking at the open source factor, and, you know, it, this didn't work really that well, <laughs> but... Um, but that's that's how it started off, and then you know, lots of our colleagues had to flee their country and go to northern Uganda. That's why we were in the refugee settlements, and so that's sort of the way it developed. And uh, and and ever since um, we're there, I mean, we also have a couple of things. There's something going on in Pakistan, but you know, it's like somehow in Africa, it seems to be the place the place to work. Yeah. Africa seems to be the place to be. Um, finally, that was it. Uh, but Ben, do you want to add anything that we missed out? 
or you want to put a curse before we close? Um, uh, I think what we actually missed out was um, the importance of the diaspora when it comes to mitigating hate speech and also um, mitigating um, rumors and lies about human traffickers. What I, why I say this is because now almost every we are in a digital um, we are in a global village, mm -hmm. making it possible for us to be able to reach out to anyone at any given time. Mm -hmm. And it is also important for us to use this opportunity to um, be accurate, be um, be <coughs> accurate one, yes, be truthful, and also respecting each other's opinion online, creating this safe space, mm -hmm. and also making sure that we verify whichever information that we have to share before we share these messages on social media. Because one, we can be disinformation, we can be disinforming people or misinforming people or malinforming people. So yes, um, I think this is my final words for the show today. <laughs> that's a super good closing remarks. And personally, um, well, that's the end of our today's edition of uh, Nima's Pantaba. Um, we talked about um, irregular migration, basically um, the impact of um, social media and community engagement in combating irregular migration. Personally, what do I learn? I learn a whole lot of um, issues from my colleagues here. I mean, my guests um, that actually spoke at length, give an overview about irregular migration. What do I learn, um, especially from the diaspora people, people like us that live here should actually be um, accurate when they're sharing information to the people, I mean, to the people, to the prospect migrants that might actually migrate, migrate irregularly, what do I learn? I learned that um, people, or especially women, could be empowered more if they then use the dangerous routes like traveling irregularly. Um, I also learn a lot about this um, migrant media network, how they disseminate information, how they use social media, how they are empowering uh, migrants as well, prospect migrants per se, and of course, women. That's all, like I said, until I come your way next uh, month. You can actually follow us on our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram on Nimas Bantaba TV, or send us an email if you want to be part of the show, if you want to suggest topics and so on, on nimasbantaba at gmail.com. My name is Nima Jadama. That was all we have for you. And thanks to my guests, Susanna and Benedictus via Zoom. It's a bye for me. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. So we said a while. Um...